Great. So welcome to tonight's session. Uh, again, my name is Mario Piombo, Director of Innovation at Napa Learns. We're very excited to be hosting you this afternoon. Um, today is our very first uh, seminar in our seminar series. We have uh, one happening every week uh, for the next uh, four weeks. And we're very excited to be joined by two of our fabulous instructors for the Virtual Career Academy who will be talking about digital design. Um, they're going to be talking about digital design uh, careers as well as the courses that they are hosting um, that are related to digital design. And we have uh, two really fabulous guest speakers who will be talking about their careers and what they do on a day-to-day -day basis in the industry. Um, with that being said, uh, I'm gonna just provide a short overview of tonight's agenda. Um, so we're gonna do an industry overview for each of our industries. One is focused on graphic design and the other is going to be focused on 3D design. Um, we're gonna then have uh, course previews for the Napa Learns Virtual Career Academy where we dive into the course curriculum uh, and look at the uh, specific courses and requirements, uh, the pacing of those courses uh, for the, both the Adobe and Autodesk certification courses. Uh, and then we have our two guest speakers and then we have a Q&A portion. And before we go much further, I wanna introduce uh, Peg Maddox, uh, Dr. Peg Maddox, Executive Director of Napa Learns uh, and co-creator of the Napa Learns Virtual Career Academy. Welcome everybody. We're so excited that you're here and we hope you sign up for the courses if you haven't already had and invite your friends and parents and cousins and people you know. We have lots of space still. So have fun today. It'll be a great seminar. Thanks for joining us everyone. So what is the Napa Learns Virtual Career Academy? We're going to go ahead and start with this uh, because uh, we know that some of you may not have attended our initial information sessions or you may not know uh, everything that you need to know about uh, the program and what we're doing and why we're here. So the Napa Learns Virtual Career Academy is a free online learning and certification opportunity that is really aimed at uh, students that are high school plus, so anyone who's graduated high school or currently enrolled in high school and beyond. Um, and we're really focused on uh, providing an opportunity for students to, students of any age, to learn about uh, technical careers and specifically technical careers that um, lead you to a certification opportunity um, so that you can prepare yourself uh, to potentially go after one of these careers. Uh, so um, we believe that uh, certifications really are a way for you to accelerate uh, the opportunity to enter into a technology-based career. Uh, so uh, the program really is designed to do just that. Um, our program uh, is going to be led by industry experts who are also experienced instructors. So uh, these are people who either currently work in the industry or have previously worked in the industry. Um, and they're not just uh, content experts, but they're really um, people who understand uh, not only the content and the skills that you need, but they've also um, had the experience that, um, that really sets them apart from a traditional instructor. And really, We've uh, also been looking at our, our course and developed a student support model that is focused on um, providing you the opportunity to take the course, um, but also we build a whole suite of additional supports around the program. So if you do decide to apply to uh, participate in one of our uh, technical courses, uh, you'll, you'll also see that we provide um, a lot of support for you as you go through the course. So um, you'll have, uh, kind of success coach slash instructor who will lead you through the course. Um, you'll be able to learn more about the industry through guest speakers who will periodically come into your course and present, uh, you know, and it will align that to the course content. And then we're also going to be um, working really diligently to partner locally to um, get together with employers in these industries to find ways for you as learners to have opportunities to learn more, whether that be through uh, virtual field trips where we would maybe go in and interview people from some of these local organizations, um, all the way up to potentially internships or job shadows, depending on what kind of partnerships we can find here in the region. Um, so tonight we're joined by our two uh, digital design instructors, Lisa Gottfried, who is heading up uh, graphic design in the Adobe course, and Gary Stroman, who's leading up the Autodesk 360 Fusion uh, course. Do you guys wanna say hello? Hi, everybody. Super excited to be here. Hello. <laughs> Great. 
So uh, we're gonna go ahead and start off with our industry overview for graphic design. Uh, Lisa's gonna take it from here and I'm going to be watching the chat. So uh, if anyone has uh, any questions uh, that they'd like to submit on the chat, um, you'll wanna go ahead and click on chat. Um, you can access it at the bottom of your screen and then uh, set the option for who you're sending it to, to everyone. And then we can all see the chat uh, right there. And then um, we'll wait for a break in the presentation before we answer uh, your question. And then again, we'll have an opportunity at the end of the session uh, for Q and A um, and you'll be able to uh, talk to the instructors or talk to, to me uh, at the very end. So there we go. Do you want to take it away, Lisa? Yeah. So um, I'm Lisa Gottfried. I teach at New Technology High School grades 9 through 12 in uh, a variety of levels of graphic design, game design, and videography. So I've got a pretty wide um, range of experience, but it's for high school in particular. But then I also teach uh, teachers how to bring these kinds of techno technological pieces into the classroom. So I I'm used to teaching adults as well, which is quite nice. The wonderful thing about this particular program, Mario asked me, Mario and Peg asked me if I would teach this, and I thought, oh, well, that's a canned, um, you know, it's a canned course. I don't know what if the what if the information or the way that it's laid out in the curriculum is not really how I teach. But the amazing thing is when they showed me who actually put together this particular program, it turns out it's actually someone that I know from Adobe. Um, I belong to an organization called the Adobe Education uh, Leaders Group, which are people from all over the world who teach Adobe. And Rob Schwartz, who uh, runs something called Brain Buffet, which, which is where we're going to be using the curriculum, is the one who developed all of the, um, all of the courses, all, all of the lessons for Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign, which are the three big graphic design things that you would need if you were going to go out and be a graphic designer. And he's a teacher a lot like me. He does a lot of project-based learning, which is what my uh, wheelhouse is. And um, I just got off the phone with uh, people in the Adobe office today. We were talking about how tight the market is going to be, the job market is going to be out there, and how important it actually is to get certified, to get your foot in the door these days or will be in the, in the coming years. And so it, it just, everywhere I go, it just makes so much sense that we're doing this, that we're moving ahead with this particular program. And I'm so glad that you guys are considering this as an option for you to help with your resume and to help with your skills building. So you wanna advance the slide? Mario, please. Okay. So graphic design is um, both about using graphics and text to convey a concept or idea. Um, it could be everything from identity and branding to print production and advertising and web design. So it's, it's publishing both on the digital and on the analog level on, on paper, posters, logos, all of those things for visual communication. And uh, you can advance to the next slide if you'd like. Okay, so um, the interesting thing is that you may not want to be, well, to take a look at like who uses graphic design. So I've had uh, people in the past, even students who really, really like digital des graphic design or digital design, uh, but they say, but I want to go into medicine. And my response to them is, well, you know, they do use graphic design in the medical profession, you could actually do both. So places where you wouldn't expect graphic design, places where you do expect it is advertising and um, publishing and things, and arts, media, and entertainment, but places where you might not think about it, where it's really useful to have these skills might be a government agency or in law or in um, education or in a research lab or nonprofit product, packaging, fashion, I mean, all of the skills that we're talking about here dig into what Adobe offers with um, those three large applications. Okay, we can advance to the next one, please. So uh, last couple days ago, I just went and looked on indeed.com, which is a job posting for the job posting website for the Bay Area, and just went and looked 
at graphic designer just so you can see like what kinds of companies are looking for graphic designer and you can see it actually lays out pretty much like what we're talking about everything from banana republic which is a clothing company to um, abbott laboratories which is very much scientific and research-based laboratory so there's you could imagine that these particular skills you might be sitting uh, in an office where you're the, the only person who does graphic design for your company, or you might be part of a team of people that works for your particular company. I would assume that Banana Republic has a whole team of people that, that does uh, all of their assets and graphic design needs. So um, there are very different ways to be out in the world, in the corporate world, uh, like embedded within an organization, or you could be a freelancer that's working on your own. All right, next slide. So, um, as of today, was this for this month, Mario? It's anything that's currently an active job post. Anything that's currently an active job post. There are currently 4,000 uh, job postings in design in, in the Bay Area right now for people who can use those skills. And we're going to take a look at like, what the average pay is for somebody who works in industry. I believe that's the next one. Yeah. So um, anywhere from as a an entry level position for a graphic design specialist at sixty six thousand, all the way up to creative directors and supervisors that make you know over a hundred, a hundred thousand a year. It it's going to depend on like how big your team is and who you have underneath you and and what it is that you're actually uh, doing for the company. And like I said, in terms of what your day might look like, you might work in a corporate office, you might work for a tiny company, you might be a freelancer, you might be a temporary subcontractor, um, you might create your own, your own work that you are interested in and sell it in the marketplace, or uh, you might work remotely, you could possibly work anywhere in the world and do this kind of work. And then the learning path, you can take various different learning paths to get there. You could go to a four-year university and become a graphic design major or go into product design or fine arts, which is my background. You could go into marketing and communications or even game design, but it's not actually necessarily what's needed. Um, you could go and do a two-year college degree and really lean on your portfolio and your experience and your certification, or you could not go to school at all and uh, just concentrate on getting certified and really beefing up your portfolio and trying to get into those positions without a college education. They're really interested in seeing your work, honestly, and whether or not you can prove that you can do what they're looking for. Nice. So uh, this all sounds fabulous, by the way, Lisa. Um, and I have, a, I have a passion for design as well. So uh, we have a question uh, from Joe in the chat who asks, how much does a uh, movie graphic designer make on average? And I guess I'm thinking that would fall into like a motion graphic design. Yeah, I mean, it could be, you know, maybe you're the person who makes all the packaging for the Harry Potter movies for the Birdie Bot beans or whatever, you know, whatever the candy and the posters and everything that goes along with that. So I don't, it could be that you're hired per, you know, per the movie and then you have to go look for another uh, project to work on once the movie ends. So I don't actually know what those numbers are. I would assume that down in LA, the numbers are pretty similar to what's here in the Bay Area in terms of like beginning, intermediate, and, and more uh, higher ups. But I, uh, I can't speak to that. I think uh, also something to think about, Joe, is uh, motion graphic designers and people who do animated uh, graphic uh, you know, work, it, it, that's really an extreme high demand right now. Um, so maybe you're also thinking about. I mean, there that. are people doing movie poster composites, compositing, there are people who are doing, um, like there's any range of things, like just the signage that goes on the fake high school, the fake sign that goes on the high school <laughs> prop, you know, that goes in front of the building where they want to shoot and um, yeah, and pretend like that's the high school. Awesome. And I guess I should have done this on the, at the beginning of the uh, introduction, uh, Lisa, but can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you, like, what's your uh, relationship yeah. with uh, digital media and digital design? So I own my own video company here in the Napa Valley for the uh, 17 years. 
And then I've been teaching now for about eight years. So I was hired out of industry to teach a career tech ed position. So I did not come from the teaching world, although I did get my master's in education. Thank you to Napa Learns for helping with that. <laughs> and uh, so I used to do motion graphics. I used to do um, a lot of promotional videos for wineries, um, food videos, book trailers, all kinds of things for people. Awesome. And why were you, why were you interested in pursuing digital media? I think when I went into, uh, let's see, I fell in love with filmmaking and that was kind of how I fell into video production. And then as I, for the 17 years, I just kept, you know, dabbling in Photoshop and Illustrator because you need assets and things like that when you're doing, even when you're filming, especially I was just a one man operation and I hired subcontractors to do things for me. So, um, you know, for me, going into education has really taught me a whole bunch about, uh, I think I went in not knowing a lot about Illustrator, and I've learned a ton about how it operates, same with Photoshop. So I learned as much in the eight years, I think, as my students have. So I'm kind of excited to teach this because I'm, I'm hoping to fill in some of the gaps that I have in my own skill set by also doing the course with everybody else. That's awesome. I yeah. think I might take your course, too. because yeah. I. I could use the certification. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm only, I'm certified in Photoshop right now. So I would love to get certified in Illustrator. And I have a feeling after too. teaching the course, you'll, you'll, you'll probably be able to pass the certification test. Well, and the great thing I wanted to mention that is that when we were talking to Rob at Brain Buffet about it, he said, basically, if you're paying attention to the things that he's having you do, you're pretty much going to pass the certification. Mm -hmm. He's actually written a lot of the certification tests. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's pretty trustworthy that if you just pay attention and do the work, you will pass the test. That's awesome. Rob, Rob is full of energy too. I hope we get to have him on yeah. as a speaker in your course. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Kyle from the chat asks, uh, can someone who only has a certification without any work experience still get a job? How would you su suggest obtaining work experience or a portfolio to show your work? Um, portfolio is just about building, showing your skills. So I think that some of the things that we're going to do in our course are going to be like uh, things that you could actually put in your portfolio when you're done. Um, and if not, you could be creating your own projects with some of those skills that you'll be doing to put in your portfolio. But when you say you're certified, it basically says to the industry, I have all the skills that are needed for an entry level position. In, in industry as a graphic designer, especially if you have all three. And that's kind of unusual for a young person to have all three of those right out of the bat. Um, and yeah, it takes a while for, sometimes adults don't actually go through the process of getting certified. They just go and find the experience or they have found the experience in the past. So it's really ultra important that if you don't have experience that you have that certification that says, yes, I do have those skills that you're looking for and I can prove it. Awesome. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Those are uh, the two questions we've gotten so far. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, thanks, Lisa. So I think, uh, Gary, you're up to talk about 3D design. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to start off actually by giving me a little bit of history of my background. So um, I actually went through the digital design graphics technology program myself as a student uh, over 20 years ago uh, here at the Napa Valley College. Uh, it's the program I'm currently teaching. It's a two-year program. Um, obviously, I finished that, and I went and got my four-year degree in, um, from Cogswell Polytechnical College, where uh, I specialize in 3D modeling. And uh, I worked in the local industry as a contractor. So, in fact, uh, a lot of my skill set overlaps uh, with some of Lisa's because uh, I use a lot of the Adobe software as well. So, um, things I've done in the local industry, um, mechanical design, digital design, uh, video editing, web design, um, graphics for print, graphics for web, um, ant trade show videos, uh, 3D modeling, obviously, um, you name it, I've done, I've done some of it, which is one of the greatest things I love about what I do is because every project's a little bit different and every project is, uh, has its own challenges and learning curves to it. So I don't ever feel like I'm doing the same thing uh, all the time. Um, 
I actually came back to the Napa Valley College back around 2007 as a part-time instructor, um, but I've been program coordinator for the last seven years, and uh, we are an Autodesk training center, uh, so every course that we offer at the Napa Valley College uh, in the DDGT program does come with its own level of certification, uh, and that includes the course that we will be teaching here, Intro to 3D Printing. Uh, you will earn a certificate of achievement from Autodesk. That's about $1,000 worth of training if you were to go take that certification anywhere else. So you're gonna get that. And then on, there's different levels of certification with Autodesk. So there's a certificate of achievement, which is the one I just discussed. That's uh, the easiest way to say that is I went and I was presented information and I, you know, and I attended it, uh, but it doesn't really rate the fact that you're proficient with it. So there are other additional levels of certification. There's the certified user, which will also be available to you at the end of the semester. Uh, and that is where you will actually take an online exam. Um, and if you pass it, that'll actually state from Autodesk that you'll be proficient with the software. So it's not my word, it's Autodesk word. So uh, that's just a little bit about um, my background. The 3D printing class, uh, we've actually incorporated 3D printing into the uh, two-year program for, it was around when I was a student 20 years ago. People th think relatively uh, that 3D printing is you know, relatively new, but it's been around a lot longer than most people actually think. It's just really taking um, uh, awareness now, really, uh, with, the, with the public. So um, the problem with uh, what we had is you had to take a whole two years of my program in order to get into uh, 3D printing. So a couple of years back, I built uh, the DDGT 130, uh, which is Introduction to 3D Printing as a standalone class. So you didn't have to come in, you'd have to take two years, you could come in with no prerequisites, as if you've never touched a computer, you can come right in, you could learn, uh, 3D modeling and you can actually print some of your own designs and get a lot of your own creativity put into it. And that's the same class that we're gonna be actually taking or offering through this Napa Learns. So uh, there is gonna be, uh, the, you will be getting, a, can I say definitely yet Mario? I don't know, we're working on making sure that you'll earn college credit for it. So that's still in process, but. Yeah, there's, a, there's a very good chance that you'll be able to receive college credit if you take the 3D design course. And one, one thing uh, that I wanna also plug that I, I'm not sure we are super clear on uh, with Lisa's is uh, that we are offering, if you, if you do sign up for our graphic design uh, course offerings, that's going to be a, a Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign certification, uh, which if you pass all three, uh, you'd be considered an Adobe graphic design specialist is the, the name of the certification. Um, Gary, I have a kind of a random question for you. So yeah. you, you were in 3D modeling and that would have been in like the early 2000s, yep. I guess, or so that, that uh, like the 3D printing craze hadn't happened. And so you were kind of on the cutting edge. Why, why did you know that, or how did you know that 3D was gonna be big or were you just passionate about it? What led you to 3D design specifically? Well, when I went through the DDGT program, um, like I said, 20 plus years ago, I've been using Autodesk products for over 20 years um, and Photoshop and things like that as well. But um, when I, back then 3D was pretty rare. If you did any kind of 3D at all, it was like, even if it looked hokey by today's standards, it was it still blew people away. Like, oh my God, that is so cool. And uh, the, the four-year school where I went, actually, and it's still in existence uh, down in the South Bay, um, it really gears people up to go into the video game industry or the movie industry and to do those type of special effects. But when you get out into those type of industries, you are so niche. Uh, you know, that's the thing I love about my program is when we actually do an animation, you're doing everything from the beginning of the modeling to the animation to the materials to the lighting to the rendering you're, you're doing everything but out in the industry you have to pick one of those specialties and kind of focus on it so um animation was uh is a lot of fun but it's a lot more work than i really want to put in sometimes and it can be very <laughs> frustrating so um i just really enjoy to come back to your question i just really enjoy 3d modeling it's just one of my fun things I like to do, it's what I do in my free time um, when I have that. <laughs> but um, it, it is just one of those things I just really, really enjoy. 
So um, I actually got into 3D modeling before the 3D printing was really um, as well known as it is today. Uh, but you know, they go hand in hand today. Yeah. L last question. Was there any, was there any like inspiration in the nineties? Like I, I know, like I was inspired by a lot of movies and video games. Did you have like one or two things that you were like, wow, I'd really love to be in that. It wasn't so much that, but you know, what's interesting is when I started learning 3d, I literally would look at the world with a different set of eyes. I would be like just going down the road and I'd be looking at something like, yeah, I could model that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can do that. I could figure out how to make that happen. And, and it's the same thing. You watch commercials on, on TV today. I'm like, yeah, I bet you they use the, these programs or something similar to that. I, I could recreate that commercial if I wanted to. I do that too all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I do that too and I watch like ads on TV. Yeah. Actually, like car ads. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I could do that. I just need, I just need a, uh, you know, a million dollar car crane and, you know, and the really cool car. <laughs> Someone asks uh, from the chat, is it safe to assume this would be 3D animation only rather than 2D? In, in just, just to be clear, this my class is. Uh, well, which class is she referring to, Alicia? Yeah, I think she's uh, referring to your class. Okay, so my class. Uh, there's not actually animation in the intro to 3D printing, uh, but it will be 3D modeling. You actually build everything from the 3D model from the very beginning, parts and assemblies. In fact, um, I don't, can we make the screen bigger or not? But I'm going to move this right up to my camera if you guys can see this. I don't know if I can do that. But yeah, um, big now. this is uh, a typical project in my two-year program. This is printed as one piece, even though it's a three piston engine that moves and articulates. That's so amazing. You will be creating your own design that will actually come right off the 3D printer. Um, we, there's a process we have to run through what's known as a bath, but you're gonna, this is one of the type of projects you'll be asked to do in our class. You're actually gonna model 3D assembly and print it out as one. So that's, that's just cool. a typical example. So, prob so to answer your question, probably not a lot of animation per se, more 3D design. Yeah, I have 3D animation, my two-year program at the college, uh, but not in this class. Awesome. Do you want to give an overview of the, the 3D design industry and where it fits in terms of careers? Yeah, I mean, I actually was talking to my guest speaker, Kyle, earlier today. And, uh, you know, one of the things I was mentioning is... Uh, you don't typically see a job posting specifically for 3D printing or 3D printer because it's not, it's, it's the way it is today is that's like an additional tool in your tool set of other things that you're doing. But he actually corrected me. He actually found a job specifically for 3D printers. So, um, or 3D printing. So that's even coming around. But the truth is you, when you start going through the slides here uh, in this lecture, you're gonna be amazed of all the different industries that are using 3D printing at some level, way more than you think you, that, that actually is being used. And um, yeah, it's it's gonna blow your mind when you, you hear this. So um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought there. What was, the... <laughs> but it, it, it's gonna it's gonna surprise you when you see all the different types of options available, so. Yeah, well, let's but, dive into it. Yeah, so. And here's some of those examples. So um, we're, there's a couple slides here. These are just a handful of industries that I picked out, but this is by no means limiting it to these industries. Uh, here are a couple pictures of uh, 3D printing used in the architecture industry. So the image on the left is just a 3D print of a, a building that they're gonna make. And you could use this to show the client so they can better visualize it. You could take, because this is just sitting on a little desk. You could use that um, uh, for presentations. You could use it for the planning department and things like that. Uh, but 3D printing for construction is actually being utilized as well. If you look on the right, this building here was actually 3D printed using concrete as the material. So after it's actually printed and they can do this literally in one day then they just come in there and then add like you know the stucco or whatever type of facing materials they want on there and uh, dress it up but the whole building could be built really fast like i said in a day or so 
And there's a lot of different companies coming out and doing that. Now, when you hear 3D printing, most people typically think that it prints plastic and that's about as far as it goes. But if you look on the, the image on the left, that is printed out of metal. And if you look at the image on the right, that was 3D printed with actually carbon fiber. So they can make incredibly strong parts ready to use right out of the uh, printer. Uh, the, the limitation is what type of printer do you have access to? So, cause each one of these requires special types of printers. Okay. The ones we have specifically at the college print plastic, ABS, PLA, and ASA, if you've heard of those uh, type of materials. Um, if you jump to the next slide, uh, it's being used in the fashion industry. Nike, Adidas, uh, other ones are actually 3D printing shoes, custom to your foot. They can act, a lot of co uh, companies will actually scan your body and they can make a product that is custom fit specifically to you. Uh, there's a, on the, on the right there, um, I don't know if the glasses were 3D printed, but the dress was. So it's in fashion as well. Um, if you jump to the next uh, slide, it's being used in the food industry. So they're 3D printing desserts. The ones, the images on the right, they're just using sugared powder, uh, which is a similar technology to what's known as powder metallurgy, if you've heard of this where they actually take metals that are ground so fine into powders, they can make mixtures between the different powders to get the um, material that they want. And then they actually um, put it into a mold and compress it. And that puts it into what's known as a green state. And then they put it into an oven through a process known as sintering, which melts it to the point where the molecules uh, bond to each other, but doesn't actually melt. And they're doing the same process here with sugar. It's just powder. Why not? Uh, same thing on the left. They're, they're high-end in, uh, food industries, four-star Michelin restaurants. They are trying to take whatever edge they can to make themselves the next level. So try making that cake on the left freehand, <laughs> you know? So there, you're seeing this in so many different industries in so many different ways. Uh, is there is there one more slide? I can't remember. Yeah, and obviously you'll use it in the medical industry. Uh, the image on the right there, you're seeing a prosthetic hand, uh, all, all, all sorts of prosthetics. But on the left, they're actually, yes, believe it or not, they are 3D printing organs. They are 3D printing cartilage. They are 3D printing veins, all sorts of things. It's still... Uh, in process, they're still having a lot of uh, technical challenges that they have to overcome, but they're doing it, it's happening. Uh, so you may not realize that you could still learn 3D modeling, you could apply this type of stuff in all sorts of other industries. It doesn't just have to be mechanical design, which is what most people think of. Awesome. Do we have any questions uh, so far regarding these careers or Nothing so far in the chat. We can go ahead and flip to the slide here, Gary. Yeah, and and uh, Mario, you pulled these up. So this was from Indeed, or was this? Uh... This is uh, from a regional uh, report on occupations uh, in uh, Napa, Marin, Lake, and Mendocino counties. Okay, so the t you're going to use three D printing in a lot of designing uh, industries. Um, again, I don't think you're going to see too many specifically where it says 3D printer, printer, what they're looking for, but it'll be one of the skill sets that they're looking for within that title. Now, um, the software that we're going to be using in this course is called uh, Fusion 360 made by Autodesk. It is a um, cloud-based software. And the, the purpose of this software is really meant to go to either 3D printers or to go to CNC machines. So CNC stands for uh, Computer Numerical Control. So if you've ever seen where they take a hunk of metal and they remove the metal with, uh, with machining bits to get to the final part, that's known as subtractive manufacturing. You can take your models out of Fusion 360 and go that route. You could take your models and go our route, which is where we start with nothing and we print everything up layer by layer 
and that's known as additive manufacturing. So um, again, all these industries will use it. I'd say at a very minimum, you're going to be making at least 60 grand, if not more, uh, at the entry level, um, just to give you an idea of where you would start. Is it CNC also used on wood? It can be, uh, not typically though. Usually it's made out of metal. Um, there are laser etchers and engravers that can work on wood, but not typically on wood. That's a good question. Uh, how, much, how much of the skills in uh, fusion could be translated to uh, like 2D C CNC type, or not, maybe not 2D, but like CNC and that kind of uh, technology? Oh, it's 3D. It's built right in. I don't okay. focus on that aspect. We do have classes at the college uh, in the machining program that use the same software that I'm teaching you. They just apply it for their CNC machine because I don't have a CNC machine. <laughs> so we're focusing on the 3D printing aspect of it. But yeah, there's tools built in that'll go one way or the other. Very cool. Yeah, let's see. And uh, Mario pulled us up today. Just in the Bay Area, there are over a thousand jobs available for three D design right now at the moment, which is awesome. Lots of opportunity. So we kind of talked about this, um, the type of jobs that are going to look for this or anything that will say three, 3D design or 3D CAD, uh, computer aided design. Uh, and again, it's across the board as far as what type of industries you can go in. At a very minimum, I'd say you'd be making more like $20 an hour plus as an entry level position. I'd say 20, 25 is actually more average for an entry level. But again, you could jump right in and um, work your way up the ladder quite quickly. Okay. One of the big skills for this is you need to be able to work as a member of a team. And this is true for Lisa as well. You need to be able to work as, an in, um, as a team, but also independently. So when you're having meetings on a design, you have to be, uh, and I'll, I'll have these kind of meetings with every student one-on-one. -on -one. When you come up with your own concept of what you want to print, I'm going to troubleshoot it for you because I want you to have a, a successful print. I don't want you to make a paperweight. Okay. I want you to be successful when you print it and not waste material. So as you're coming up with the design, I'm going to throw ideas at you. Okay. Well, what if, if you did this, it might be a weak point. What are you going to do to strengthen that up here? These parts might fuse. What are you going to do to keep them separate? So I'm going to, and that's the same type of thing you're going to do out in the industry. When you're looking at a design, you're playing the what if game or the, the being the devil's advocate. If something's going to go wrong, how are we going to prevent that? So um, you're going to have to be able to talk and, and communicate with people in a team in that kind of environment. But after that team meeting, you need to go back and work independently on whatever it is you guys came up with. So kind of both. <laughs> awesome. Uh, let's see. I think, uh, that was a great presentation, by the way. Is is are there any questions out there regarding uh, 3D design? I think there is. Uh, there's one that came in on the chat. Uh, CNC is becoming like 3D printers, like Gary was stating. If you set the limitations of the machine to handle the parameters you are providing, uh, then you can CNC it. It's uh, like use. Uh, it was using. I was using it for MDF, medium dense fiberboard, but also for plastics. Some industries are using it for food. So sounds like Kyle really knows his stuff. <laughs> awesome. Any other questions uh, or comments regarding uh, 3D design careers before we jump into the course previews? Uh, nope. All right. Bueller? Nope. All right. If anyone has anything, you can go ahead and uh, throw it in the chat. Uh, we're going to do. Uh, our course preview portion of the presentation now. So in this section of uh, tonight's presentation, uh, each of the instructors will be providing a little bit more of an in-depth overview of the specific courses that we're offering. So just as a reminder, um, you know, really our program uh, is much bigger than what's just happening tonight. Um, we're providing the opportunity for 
Um, anyone who is high school and above who's interested in either one of these careers uh, in graphic or fields really, either graphic design or 3D design, if you're interested in earning an industry certification in either of these areas, Napa Learns is going to be um, hosting online courses and paying for certification exams for anyone who wants to uh, progress through those courses. So Lisa, do you want to provide us an overview of the yeah. Adobe course? Sure. Hit it. Um, okay, so let's, we're obviously working in Adobe. We're hoping that most people will have their own computers. If not, uh, we have a virtualized system where you can use a lower end laptop and plug into a lab uh, using, so basically reaching back to a computer that can run that software. Um, and we're testing it now to just make sure there isn't any latency or if there is latency that we, we know how to handle that as we move forward. Um, but we're suggesting that if people have machines that they can use the Adobe software on it, that they do that. Okay, so um, this is the basic outline. You're gonna, we're gonna start in Photoshop we're gonna um, finish with InDesign toward the end of the course. So each project lasts a week long and you should expect to spend about five hours a week on your own. Uh, I don't think five hours actually includes class time. I'm not sure if we included that. Somewhere between five to six hours a week. So it's like attending a real, like a college class like you would, um, there's a certain amount of seat time that's expected. Um, we're also working with the college to see if we can get college credit to, uh, like if you pass the test, then you get college credit. We, we're continuing to meet about that. So you start with photo editing, uh, and then we're gonna look at compositing with magazine covers and album covers. And then uh, we'll look at doing some actual assets for videos, like lower thirds uh, and things like that, because uh, that's how I wound up getting involved in Photoshop was through video. And then just look at some design, some design things, like what does a designer actually think about when they're designing? And then there's a quiz at the end of each lesson. So each project will be a week long, then there's a quiz. And then the last week of that series of classes. So if it says project one through six, the seventh week will be test prep and testing. So we're gonna try to get you to test on Photoshop right after you do all the Photoshop work. Same thing with Illustrator. You can see we're, uh, Illustrator's more like for logo design, vector art, t-shirt design, um, logos that go on buildings, um, flyers and signage. Uh, we'll even, uh, there's even one for doing an, an app on the phone. And uh, let's see, for InDesign, InDesign is more about putting together a publication, like whether it's a magazine or a newspaper or a brochure. So it's um, sort of taking all those Photoshop elements, Illustrator elements, and all the words that you want to put and put it together in a layout that works. And I'm super excited actually, because uh, I'm gonna be learning along with you guys in InDesign. And Photoshop and Illustrator, we're gonna get to you by, by um, Thanksgiving. And then we're gonna take a break and we'll start up again in early January to do InDesign and we'll finish in mid-February, hopefully by, by uh, Valentine's Day. Awesome. And so anyone who anyone who applies and is accepted into the Adobe course, all of our or either of the courses, all of our courses at uh, the Napa Learns Virtual Career Academy will begin the week of August 31st. So um, uh, definitely be thinking about that in terms of what your uh, workload is going to be like or your school load is going to be like uh, when you take on, right. um, as Lisa mentioned, uh, five to six hours a week for this course. Um, it's like being enrolled in another college course. Yeah. In terms of time. And then uh, let's go to the next slide here. Here we go. Okay. And then uh, I'm ho we, what we're planning on doing is meeting once a week to 
review any technical problems that you're having to maybe show each other our work and critique and then have discussions about how it went that week and have guest speakers. So I'm more like a coach than I am a teacher. I'm not actually presenting you the curriculum information. I'm just there. If you need help, I'll be there to answer emails if you get stuck. Um, this is really like, this is the brilliance of learning online. It's like best of both worlds. You get to go at your own pace. You get to do it when you have time, as long as you can keep up with it. So really think about whether or not you think you can keep up with this along with whatever other things you have going on, whether it's work or uh, other things. And then I'm tentatively setting this that we'll meet in our weekly cohort on Thursdays from 6.30 to 7.30. We're open to changing that time either earlier or later, depending on what people might be interested in. And then I've got the dates for when we'll be testing. And I do expect that everyone will use their webcam and mic and participate as if they're in a live college class. And we're gonna use um, probably like Google Docs, Remind, and Discord to talk to one another. So we'll have some sort of back channel, like if you have a question that uh, you want an immediate response from, we'll, we'll use Discord for that. And then Remind will be like me sending you things that maybe you need to think about for that week. Um, you know, try not to spam you guys. And then you'll put all your finished work into the Google Doc. And the cool thing is like, I'm not gonna grade your work. I mean, I'll give you feedback on it and I'll help you accomplish whatever it is that they're asking for online, but there are really no grades. It's you either pass the test or you don't pass the test. So it's really up, you have to be a, an independent learner that is independently motivated to uh, get the work done and then I'll just be there to help you. Great. And then um, for people that may not be familiar with online learning, what's it like to actually go through um, in this case, it would be Brain Buffet and um, do that learning independently. What, what do they There's a lot of, there's videos, right? So you'll watch a video. You might have it a window open that allows you to take notes right side by side with the window. Uh, the, the videos are fabulous. They're on point. There's no rambling. They're written really well. Uh, and they just take you through. And what you'll do is have the video open and then you'll have the application open side by side and you'll do what that person is asking you to do, what they're saying, look, here's what it looks like on my screen, then you do it on your screen. So some of the people that I've taught at New Tech should be fairly familiar with that particular learning style, but, um, and you can stop and rewind if you missed it. So uh, I think for someone who is motivated and can move through that, it, it's you can be highly successful. And if you get stuck, I'll be there to, you can email me or contact me through Discord and I'll see if I can help you out. Awesome. And yeah. so as Lisa mentioned at the beginning too, uh, it definitely, the best learning experience for either of these programs is gonna be if you have access to a uh, Mac or a PC and you can actually run the um, software um, on a on an actual computer that it's designed for. If you only have access to a Chromebook, we may have a workaround where we can virtually um, get you connected and you'd be able to run the software um, virtually and have it streamed into your computer. Um, so don't let that discourage you from applying if you haven't yet applied. Um, and uh, there is a question in the chat about when we will be making our decisions around who's accepted into the program. Um, the we are gonna have uh, the courses begin the week of um, August 31st. And so um, that being said, uh, we're looking at um, two weeks prior, um, the week of the 17th, I believe it is, uh, making our final decisions. Um, so if you're interested, apply now, and we're gonna try to get any, we're gonna try to get as many people who apply into the program. So, um, you know, definitely submit your application and. In addition to that initial application, we will be um, reaching out to have you guys uh, just write a really brief personal statement around why you're interested in the program and why you think um, you'd be a good fit for the opportunity. Um, as a reminder, uh, the courses are being uh, presented to you all at no cost. Uh, Napa Learns and our donors are uh, fully funding every aspect of uh, the course. So which is an incredible offering. That it, is it, it amazing. Is pretty, it, it is pretty incredible. We've never done it before. Uh, it's, it's definitely um, 
a very uh, unique opportunity that you should definitely take advantage of. Um, one of the things to consider too is we're not just paying for the course um, itself, which you could probably access online. We're paying for the course, the act any kind of prep that goes with uh, preparing for the exam, and then we're uh, paying for the certification itself. And then on top of that, um, all of the additional supports in the instructor, the, the people like Lisa and Gary, who are gonna be meeting with you on a regular basis and helping you out, um, reviewing any questions, answering any questions, bringing in guest speakers. Um, so it is really um, a really fabulous opportunity that you should definitely be taking advantage of if you're thinking about doing this. Um, and the one thing I would say is that um, files are provided in the um, curriculum. So your final product should look like the final product that's on the screen. So we might have some opportunity to do some of our own stuff that um, Oh, I've got to really take a look at it and see there is room and flexibility if we want to do our own like self-chosen projects that still work on those particular skills but really it's it's like you get the file you get you get the things that you need they tell you what to do with that particular file and then yours looks like the end result that's actually shown on the online course that's awesome yeah it's it's a cool model um, I a couple things I also want to mention um, Chuck McMinn, our board president, is watching, and he, he also said, remind them that they get access to the Adobe license as well. So, oh, uh, yeah. yeah, one of the big benefits here uh, is anyone enrolled in the <laughs> graphic design course with Adobe is going to receive um, a year of Adobe Creative Cloud licensing complements of NAP Learns, and you'll be able to use that um, in two Not ways. just for Photoshop, not just for Illustrator, not just for InDesign, but That's everything that Adobe makes. Yeah, you'll, and you'll be able to use it not only for your learning in the program, but also to advance your career in whatever way you see fit. So however you want to use that license, um, you're going to have complete access to it, which is really exciting. And then the other point that I'd like to make is, um, you know, you might be thinking about the program and kind of uh, skeptical or worried about the pressure of taking the certification exam. Um, there definitely is not a requirement that everyone who takes these courses take the certification test. If you're really just in it for the additional experience and education, that's okay. We're encouraging you uh, to take the certification because um, having a certification just presents so many more opportunities for you to really showcase your skills and bring that um, to the workforce in, you know, in terms of getting hired and being recognized for your skills. Um, but it's not a 100% requirement that you um, pursue the certification. So um, it's totally up to you. And then on that note too, you may not pass it the first time. So we'll also- Right, I was gonna say, I believe that you can take it three times. Awesome. And we've had kids in my uh, upper level classes who have retaken the test because they were so close to passing, but just not quite. And they just went back, re-reviewed their work and took it again a week later and passed it. Awesome. And then someone asked how long the Adobe license would last. It would be a, a, a one year license uh, starting in late August. So August to August. August to August, hopefully, yep. And um, you would have full access to it and uh, it would be yours for the year. Um, and then I think uh, too, to your point on not passing the test the first time, we're gonna do everything we can to prepare you guys. And we've been, uh, it, I know Lisa and I have talked to Rob who, at Brain Buffet who created the Adobe curriculum and we're, um, we're really, uh, I was really uh, interested too to hear what he said that you know, there's basically, if you go through this course, everything that you review is going to be on, on the test, <laughs> basically, yes. So we, can, uh, we can definitely, um, you know, say with confidence that you'll have a very uh, likely chance of passing if you uh, really dedicate the time to learning this tool and, and really take advantage of the fact that we have Lisa here to coach you guys if you have any questions, because if you were on your own going through this course material, um, I would say that you'd probably run into some roadblocks and you'd be looking for an expert. And so we're really fortunate to have someone like Lisa there to answer and those kind of questions. If I don't know, I know somebody who knows at Adobe. Whether, I mean, like, I can ask the people who are actually working on the product right now if we have any questions or other people who are experts in those. So, yeah. Awesome. Someone asked what you can do with an Adobe license. So, uh, you should really take Lisa's course to learn about everything you can do with it. Lisa's been in my, in my class in the past. Yeah. So there's all kinds of things. You can do audio 
um, editing, you can do video editing. There, uh, there's just so many animation, Positive character idea. animator, everything they make. Great. All right, so we're going to move on to Gary here. Uh, Gary, do you want to give a little preview of your course? Yeah. Um, OK, so first of all, before I forget, as an Autodesk Training Center, uh, you can download the software for free as a three-year trial. And that's available. All the Autodesk products are available for it to you. So uh, they do run on a PC, though. So if you have a Mac, uh, you can, I think we, we're still in the same process. We're going to be looking at those, um, uh, using your computer as a terminal and you actually remoting in and, and using the software that way. Um, so there still should be options for you if you're a Mac user. Um, what else? Um, sorry, it's been a long week. <laughs> um, OK, so let's talk a little bit about the class. So the class, we are going to be using the Ascent uh, courseware, which you will be ha able to get uh, yourself uh, electronically. Uh, that's correct, right, Mario? That's going to be included? Okay. Yes. So um, you'll have access to your own electronic version of the courseware. We will go through it together. I will actually lead you through it. Um, the class times are not set in stone right now, but we're looking at, uh, why don't you go to the next slide, if you would. Uh, we're going to be going, looking at Tuesday and Thursdays uh, evenings from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., but again, we might be uh, adjusting that. Uh, we have 90 hours we need to make sure we fulfill because you uh, are looking at earning college credit for this. Now, in that uh, ascent, we're going to be learning the Fusion 360 and how that works. So obviously, before we can model any of our own designs, uh, we need to learn how to uh, use the, uh, how to make something, right? So we're going to be using the ascent software to, to learn how to actually the interface works and how to make things. And there, each chapter uh, will have its own um, practices at the end that you will be doing as homework assignments and submitting in. Now, because this uh, software is cloud-based, uh, you will be creating a project and then sharing that project with me so I can log in um, remotely. I, you don't have to ever submit anything to me. You don't have to email anything. I just have access to it and I can go in there and look at it anytime I need to. And um, we'll be critiquing those together. Now, I have every intention of teaching this class uh, synchronously as if you were going to plan on logging in at the same time. I do record every one of my videos uh, and I will be posting those on, we have our own department website, uh, ddgt.net. I'm actually going to put into the chat window here a link. I just finished this page this morning. Um, can I share my screen real quick? Uh, yes. Uh, let me add you as a, I'm going to make you the host really quick. Sure. Um, which will allow you to do that. There you go. Thank you. Okay, so I just put this page up, I uh, finished it this morning, but these are the type of projects students have created um, in this course. So just to get an idea of what you're going to be doing, you're going to get 60 cubic inches of material to work with, and how you decide, decide to divvy that up among your projects uh, is going to be up to you. There's going to be three levels of complexity. The first one is just a simple standalone part that doesn't move such as a business card holder. Now, obviously, this has color on it, but it will print out as one uh, single color. But um, that's just a static standalone part. So that would be like a level one assignment. Uh, this here is an iris that he designed that actually fully articulates, and this thing gets printed as one piece. This would be a level three type project. So you can see that in the open state here. So if we scroll down through here, you can see people have done all sorts of things. They've done dream catchers. Um, this is a jewelry stand, sunglass cases. Uh, we had one student made their own box for um, some audio video switches. Um, we have a three pi uh, one piston engine here. Somebody made their own plane. Um, somebody made their own sword. This one's a cool one here. This, this student actually made a fully articulated robot from 
I don't know what video game or anime it came from, but um, it was called ALOC for anybody who knows what that is. But this thing was printed as separate pieces, but it's all joints. So it can actually be, um, art, uh, it articulates and moves. I lost the page. Uh, here we are. So this is what it actually looked like when it was 3D printed. And if you, this is what's a, what we call a section view. So you can see the inside. So you'll see that we have this pink object and this yellow object, and you can see how there's a gap all the way around it. The head actually spins 360 degrees because when it was printed, those parts never touched. So there's all sorts of things you can do. You can check this out for more ideas, but this is the type of stuff students have been doing. Okay. Now, um, I'll go ahead and let you share again, Mario, if you would. Sure. So after we get through the Ascent courseware, why am I not seeing it? I'm not seeing it. There we go. There it is. Okay, thank you. Uh, after we get through the Ascent courseware, there are, and you obviously have the three projects you will be creating, there's also a presentation you will be giving to the class. You are going to be re doing about a 20-minute presentation on any aspect really get, uh, regarding 3D printing. It could be... Um, the actual equipment 3D printers itself. It could be um, a specific industry that it's being used on. I don't care. You're going to give me a, do a 20 minute lecture. You can use video uh, videos. You can use other present uh, presentational materials, but you're going to present that out to the class so that we all get um, more experience in other ways the 3D printing is being used out in the industry. And then on top of all of that, I will also there's about nine units I will be covering. Um, that will also show how uh, 3D printing is being used in all sorts of industries, different types of materials that are being used. Uh, um, how many people, has anybody ever heard of 4D printing? It's actually when you 3D print something that can actually change it shall, uh, change shape over time by itself. Wow. So I'll let you think about that for a second. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. So um, those are all just different type of things that we're going to be uh, talking about. Now, as I said, I'm going to be teaching this class synchronously, but if you don't have the ability to log in during those times, you can actually watch my videos and uh, at your own pace, uh, at your own time, and still keep up with the class. I will highly recommend that you still try to follow along during class time because you will be uh, more likely to succeed in the class. Um, I do, uh, just like Lisa said, I expect that um, if you are going to show up that you have a microphone and that you have a camera so that you can actually participate and um, ask questions and such. So. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks for the, the preview. Um, I think we're gonna, I'm gonna jump into just a couple of really basic course requirements and then we're gonna move over to our guest speakers. Um, so uh, we're really excited that you guys are interested in the opportunity. Um, I just wanna, a couple of these things are pretty obvious and things that may have already been discussed, but if you're going to apply and participate in the course, um, you definitely wanna be comfortable working independently. So um, time management, keeping track of your time and really uh, taking ownership of uh, completing these assignments and tuning in on a weekly basis for your class sessions. Um, you, have, you should have a willingness to complete all the assignments and participate in that way. We'd love to make sure that you guys are on top of it and completing the work and um, completing the course materials. Um, you should be eager and willing to learn about technology. These are very uh, technical programs and uh, you know they have a technical aspect. Um, so hopefully you're interested in technical careers. Um, you know, you should have access to a Chromebook or a more powerful computer, and you should have a strong, reliable Wi-Fi connection. Um, and there may be other requirements that uh, Lisa and Gary talked about, but those are kind of just some basic requirements from the, you know, Virtual Career Academy that apply to all of our courses. Um, so uh, hopefully you guys are uh, getting a lot out of this. So we kind of have a four-step process to applying one uh, was uh, to attend an information session. We have recorded information sessions on our uh, program page. So that if you're interested in learning more about the specific opportunity uh, that Napa Learns is presenting, you can watch that to learn more. Um, you could attend a summer uh, 
seminar series uh, presentation, which you're in one right now, so you're already uh, doing that. We do have uh, three more coming up. So we have uh, one every um, Wednesday for uh, the next three weeks coming up. Um, so sign up for those if you're interested in the other career areas or other courses. Um, and then, you know, you'll submit an application, a two-part application, um, including a statement about yourself, which I mentioned, uh, in addition to our form application. And then hopefully you'll be accepted and you'll, you'll start the program in August. Um, so that's just a very basic overview. Um, I want to get to our uh, first uh, guest speaker. Lisa, do you want to introduce our guest speaker? I do. So um, Juliana is the assistant designer at Wine Glass Marketing. So she is local and in the wine community. And I'm um, so pleased to have her on the call and pleased to know her. And when I met her, I got so excited. We started geeking out over Adobe immediately. And um, I'm going to, Juliana, I'm going to let you sort of talk a little bit about what you do. Okay. Um, hello everyone. Um, it's kind of interesting cause I was going through things I wanted to talk about and I feel mostly with designers, we have, uh, two parts to what we are as designers. We sometimes, especially if we work, um, in marketing or in advertising, we focus a lot our design skills on that. But then if we have that creative aspect, we have always these side projects that have nothing to do with what we're working on on our eight to five um, work. So it's, um, it's funny because I believe I have two sides, um, especially when I work with design. Um, here, working um, with wine glass marketing, we do a lot for marketing. So we do a lot of things to help our clients in the wine industry. So it's, it, it can sound serious and um, not exciting, but it does give you a space where you can inject a little bit of creativity in what you're doing. But um, let's see, I've been working in wine glass marketing now for a year, a year and four months more or less. I started with um, working with email design, so email marketing which for me was a challenge in the beginning because I didn't know a lot about HTML. And although I knew it was something that I was required to, even though when I was, even especially when I was back in, in school, I knew coding was something that was important, but I always found a way to get away from it because I didn't want to, <laughs> but, um, which sucks because you shouldn't run away from something like that. You should actually try your best to learn it. So I was um, lucky in a way that my boss um, sat down with me here in Wine Glass Marketing and he actually taught me the basics so, and then gave me a lot of projects to do. So he gave me first two weeks a full course and then the third week he was like, okay, here's the, here's the project. Now you go, now you do it. So it was a lot of banging my head against the wall, um, a lot of hating um, HTML more than I did before. But um, now, now seeing what I can do, um, I feel like, you know, I can do this. It's okay. Um, what am I, pa so it's funny because I do have an illustrative illustration side. I do like to draw and illustrate and I always like to be creative. So I try to bring that in wine glass marketing. Um, a lot of my designs that I do are illustrations for infographics or for emails, so we can get it a little bit more visually um, appealing. Yeah, th those are some, <laughs> thank you, Mario. Those are some of the things I do, which was something that I wasn't hired to do. <laughs> it was, they found out that um, I liked illustration and I like graphics and I, loved getting um, the project and being like, okay, this is a data project. So you need to help us present this data to someone, to the client or, or to whoever needs it. But data just being as it is can be overwhelming or it can be very boring because if you just see numbers and if you just see a lot of information, you lose, um, you lose track of it or you, lose, you, you just lose interest. 
so that's when I got into infographics and I got into infographics while working with wine glass marketing. And that was a little bit of um, putting illustration in it. But we also do a lot of print design, um, a lot of flyers, um, a lot of um, tasting notes and scores, a lot of business cards. We used to do a lot of business cards in the beginning. So we do a bit of print. But then one thing also that I wasn't hired to do and they, they found out that I could do was gifts and animation, which is a skill I learned here um, going for, for my master's in San Francisco at the Academy of Art. And it is fun. It's something that I do like a lot, animation and um, graphics in general. But it's something that um, requires a lot of work. At least I, I feel like you need to be a good storyteller to work with animation and with gifts. But it's fun. Um, so I, um, to, to go back a little bit, I am from Brazil. I came here in 2015 to pursue my master's in design. And when I came here, I was very overwhelmed because the design skills that um, the college here required for the student was over here. And I, my skills were way over here when I came. So it was, it was painful. It was very painful, but it was interesting to see other areas that design can be part of. Um, when you mentioned medicine or law or um, labs, you know, work with graphic design for labs. That's something I didn't know until I got here in the US that that could be possible. Back home, I only worked with advertising and marketing. So it's, it's good to see this other side. And that's what kept me curious and wanting to be creative. And I think that's the driving force for everyone that wants to be in design. You need to always push yourself to try and learn something and to, to ask why and to ask, how does it work? Why is it working this way? What can I do it to add my flavor to it? So it's, um, it's, it's a lifelong thing, design. You learn all of, throughout the years. You, you just, you can't stop. That's what I feel like. Because if you stop, you get stuck into this one little category and then you don't find out that with 3D printing, you can actually print DNA material. I did not know that until today. I didn't know that they were doing research to print um, skin and veins, and that, that just blew my mind. Because I thought it was just toys for, or you know, mechanics. I didn't think we were in that level yet. So it's, it's exciting, and I think everyone should strive to learn more every time. Um, let me see what else we can talk about. Um, what do you What do you wish someone would have told you when you were first going into uh, design? <laughs> I wish someone would have told me. Um, I think there's this romantic idea of the designer being a loner designer, and you know, um, late nights, and you're just working away and creating. And it can be that, but it can also can. Can you work with a team? And that is something I think people need to understand. You're working with other people. So you're going to deal with other people's egos. You're going to deal with things that you didn't see coming. So I think people skills is very important when you're working with design, which is something no one told me. And also tutorials. Oh my God, please, tutorials are your friends. And I only found that out late in life because I was just like, ah, oh, it's so boring. I don't need tutorials. I can, I can figure it out somehow, but tutorials are your friend, really. That's awesome. That's, that's what keeps you learning, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so what does a typical workday look like for you? So it depends. When we were back in the office, um, we had a bit more of interaction with each other. So we did have a lot more brainstorming sessions and being creative and feeding out of each other's creativity. Now, um, it's more the loner designer <laughs> in a way, <laughs> but um, it's go, go, go all the time. Um, now I feel like communication is more important than when we were in the office. So I'm always trying to touch base with 
either my boss or who's ever managing the, the project, just to make sure we're hitting those marks. Um, and it was something that I didn't do before. So it starts, the day starts with me looking at my email, seeing what I need to do, seeing if there are any projects in queue or any edits. Then we have usually a 9.30 meeting where we go through what we have to do for the day, if we need someone's help or if there's something that we need off of each other, like a graphic asset, um, asset or something. And then from there we all break and we all focus on our own little task for a while until we have to talk to each other again. But it varies, the day varies a lot. There are days when I don't talk to anyone after that meeting, 8.30, and then there are days that I'm just constantly talking to everyone all the time. So it really depends. Nice. And there's drama, as always. There's always drama, so. <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would you say that, um, that, uh, that more of your job is like the socializing and understanding the needs of your clients and working as a team than the technical side of being a designer? Or how, what do you think the percentage is? So it's, it's, it's interesting because it's more the technical part. I wish we got to know our clients a little bit better because the people that the first contact with our clients are our account managers, our account executives, and they pass us, they pass down information to us. And I feel like sometimes being on one on one with a client would be better with the designer because then you can actually present what you can do and you can present your view or how you see the project turning out. Something that the account executive doesn't have um, that vision. So I do, I do think it's important to socialize or to get to know the client when you're doing the job, but it's not always possible, so. Awesome. Well, yeah. uh, thanks for joining us. I wanna be in our second guest speaker. Gary, do you wanna introduce our next guest speaker? Certainly. Uh, so my guest speaker is Kyle Ebling. He is uh, a former student of mine and he was uh, working with James Loudspeaker as well. Um, Kyle wears many hats. Uh, before he came into my program, he already had uh, experience in the welding department among other uh, degrees as well. Um, and uh, he was always a pleasure to have in class. So I, I, I'm looking forward to his presentation. So Kyle, it's all you. All right. You guys can all hear me. <laughs> we can hear you. <laughs> Perfect. So uh, Gary gave an intro. My name's Kyle Ebling. I was enrolled in the, the program originally with Alan Skinner and then was convinced kind of by Gary to join over into the actual full program in 2011. Um, I actually didn't finish the program because I was directly hired out of the program because of my skills of digital design, drafting, CAD, inventor, and 3D modeling. Uh, and that kind of got pushed over into a manufacturing engineering role as an entry level. Um, I currently don't work for anybody right now. I'm unemployed. I was laid off due to the COVID situation, but the last 18 months prior to that, I was the director of engineering and manufacturing for James Loudspeaker, which is a privately owned speaker manufacturing company. It was based here in Napa, actually in the industrial park, but moved over to Minden, Nevada in 2019, which I was commuting to Minden, Nevada, 200 miles a week every day, working four days on and three days off, kind of a firefighter schedule um, while I was uh, director of engineering. Uh, so in total, I was at James for seven years. I, I started at James uh, as an entry level drafter and they learned that I also had an associate's degree in welding, which I got from the Napa Valley College as well. Um, the, I, so I got pushed over into more of the manufacturing role and was doing uh, specialized TIG welding but how to do the TIG welding was done from the schematic and the design. So they were giving me the project. I was doing the design in AutoCAD, making it into a model, taking that model into a CNC program, cutting the program and then folding all of the metal together and welding it myself to then give to the assemblers to actually build this product at, uh, in total. I did that for about a year before they pushed me over into the lead mechanical engineer. And that's what I did for five years at James. Uh, after being the lead uh, mechanical engineer and hiring on about five more engineers uh, from different schools in the area, uh, they put me into the director role when they moved the company uh, 
one is incentive to stay because I didn't really want to move to Nevada and two, to uh, give me uh, a more of a, a title of what I was actually doing for the company, which was leading and, and teaching the actual engineers at the, at the school. Um, kind of why I'm passionate about what I was doing is because prior to going to school, I was in, I went to Napa High School here locally. I graduated in 2007 and I was heavily involved in the music program. Um, I was doing vocal music workshop, chamber choir, barbershop quartet, and small other groups as well, as well as composing and arranging music. So I fi figured that was the best course of uh, choice for me to go, uh, is to go to a, a very expensive private school for music and decided to dump $78,000 on only two years of education for an associates in music theory because, you know, I, I had to go to school and pay for it and didn't have the money, so I got loans. And then when I couldn't pay for the loans, I had to leave. So then only having a, a degree in music, I jumped over into the welding technology program so I could actually get a degree or a, a career that I could go and pay off this school debt that I just acquired. I uh, couldn't find a job in welding in 2011. So while looking, I started my own business uh, as a coach for a uh, diving program here locally and was coaching varsity diving for all three high schools here in the area for about four years and then finally got picked up by uh, James Loudspeaker through this program because I was still going to school. Um, and the connection there was uh, through coaching the daughter of the owner of the, the company, he knew my skills and then brought me over. So I can't say that from directly having these skills or certificates, I was able to get a career. It was through connections, but having those skills is what gave me the ability to progress through that career and get me into a director role. Um, why I'm passionate about it is because it's in music and it's pulling all of my, my talents together. I get to bring welding, I get to bring design and drafting and innovation and creativity all into building something that I love, which is music and getting to divide, design these crazy ass speakers that I have on here that are like the, the steampunk speaker that I was there that was designed for a high end client that we spent, he spent $15,000 a piece so $30,000 for the pair on that speaker because he wanted it. And those were the types of clients that we were working on. Uh, the render on the left hand side is something that I got to work on with the clients directly. They were calling me and saying, can you please help us visualize what we want? That's not what they ever said. That's what they wanted, though. They would come and ask, this is how I want to do it. And then I would design through 3D modeling and rendering some form of a scene that would give them the innovation in the picture of what they wanted. And then they would be able to convince themselves that that is how much they wanted to spend the money to buy something like that. So through these drafting skills and, and modeling skills, where I was able to create a... Uh, something that was valuable to the client that said, yeah, I, this thing has never been built before, but because I like the way that you think, I like the way that you can present your options and you have faith in the ability to manufacture exactly what you're presenting me, I'll go ahead and do it. And that's the ability that you, you learn in these types of classes is uh, you can't just find somebody off the street. And that's something else that I found is well, while I was a director, I was trying to hire these engineers to come in and figure out how to do these things. And they have a four-year degree. They know how to do these skills, but they have no experience in the aspect of how to create something that they've never worked in before. I had the five years of experience of building them and manufacturing them to understand how they worked. So then when I went into the actual directing of it, I could give and instill that innovation to the younger guys coming out with the degree. However, they did not have the skills that, or a certificate that actually proved that they knew how to do these skills. They had a degree that said that they did, but when you actually ask them to do it or give them the task to do something with DDG and T, they can't do it. And it has a lot of errors in it and they don't go through the right process. That was the most frustrating part of being in this position is because I didn't have the degree of a bachelor's in engineering. I worked at it and I finally got to a position where I could say these are the guys that are knowledgeable in what they do and that that's how I ended up in the position that I was in of directing these guys is because they were coming to me for advice because they didn't know how to do what they had a degree to do <laughs> and it was kind of a ironic oxymoron and it took me four years of working at a lower pay rate before I actually was getting paid more than these guys uh, that were coming out of the college because they had the degree to back it up 
Um, so entry level for someone going in with just a basic drafting skill, we were hiring guys directly out of Gary's class actually at 12 to 15, excuse me, 12 to $15 an hour, um, which is basically 30 to $35,000 a year, um, which for an entry level drafter, I think is pretty reasonable, especially if not having a degree. Uh, and then through progression of showing the different tiers of, comp of your comprehension of what we were doing, you could level up and make all the way up to a senior uh, mechanical engineer for the company at about $80,000 a year or senior level management of six figures. So it really depends on how much experience within that industry, I'm specifically talking about the audio video industry, uh, that allowed you to grow through these different uh, aspects of knowledge. Um, what I wish I would have known going into the AV industry would be uh, a lot more about audio engineering, uh, frequency response, physics, uh, the aspect of electrical design on how the components work. All of this stuff is not really specifically taught in any form of just one degree. I can't go to the speaker technology school of wherever in America because it's not in existence. You have all of these different avenues that all compile together. And this is why a speaker company has different departments and different engineering groups for audio en engineering, for quality, for industrial, for manufacturing. Having all these different avenues allows them to compile it all together. So knowing these things individually would have helped me grow a lot faster through this avenue or career set that I chose. Um, but I did learn them throughout learning through mentors of higher ups and within my own company, but also through other companies that I spoke to and, and communications that I gained through the seven years of working there. Uh, a typical work day for someone in my position of uh, being a director would, was a seven to seven work day. So it's a 12 hour work day. Um, however, most days I did leave at five. Uh, the expectation was to be there at seven because we have international and domestic uh, clients. So 7 a.m. for me in California was only 4 p.m. for the guys over in the UK. So that means I only had an hour of layover there to actually talk to these people. So that was why I had to be there so early. The seven to seven was because we had so many different aspects of large scale projects that some lasted two and a half years but we also busted some really fast custom projects out in about uh, a, a day. It was really about three and a half hours from when we started the project at one and got it done at four. It really depended on who the customer was and how we prioritized uh, the order for the day. But typically get in at seven, check my emails, 8.30, set up an engineering meeting and discuss the priorities for the day. 9.30, have a meeting with the executives and this is where I would get the new large scale scopes of uh, which projects we were gonna prioritize for that day or week. Um, at 10 o'clock is when I would finally go back to my desk and organize all of these new incoming orders and get that set up to get back to the team for them to start working on. Um, at, then I have an hour lunch break from 1.30 until about two, I'd start talking with all the different manufacturing departments. That was the machining, the wood shop, the finishing department to make sure that the projects I had to get out that day were actually in progress and in the right stages that they needed to be in. Um, and if not, then I needed to communicate that workflow. And then going into the manufacturing and the quality control aspect of things is where I spent the last part of my day to inspect the incoming product that we did get from outside vendors because uh, I was kind of controlling how we manage the incoming product for the day. And if it was wrong, had to come up with a solution to actually fix that problem. Uh, and that was a recurring issue that because we were building custom built units, not standard units. So every single product was slightly different. Uh, and then the last part of the day was always set up to where if something needed to go out the next day, I had to stay late to get it done. Or if we were working on some other international project that the later part of my day is the beginning of their day, I would stay late and get that done. And this is really because I was in a upper management position. So trying to overlay across all of these different departments. The last five years prior to that, it was a typical eight to five work day, come in, sit at my desk, work on with this project, submit it to my manager and be done. That's typically where most of us wanna be when you finish up with a, some form of a certificate and you're going into an engineering or a drafting position. And that's, typic, and that's the 50 to $80,000 range that you can get if you start in that aspect. Um, as far as the skills that I've, I've learned um, through Gary's class alone was just a lot of the Adobe stuff. Uh, Autodesk, AutoCAD, Inventor, Revit was part of the software program that we were doing as well. 
Um, but I'm also constantly learning other programs, such as Rhinoceros, which is another 3D modeling program, Siemens, which is used for the naval industry for building super yachts. Uh, DraftSite is SolidWorks version of a freeware version of AutoCAD. NavCAD allows you to see different variations of the water and how they impact the aspect of, of uh, the boat when they're actually impacting. And there's other variations of that for the architectural industry that allow you to check the wind structures uh, or, or tensile strengths and whatnot um, of buildings. So uh, there's a ton of stuff that is constantly coming out and trying to stay up on the new latest and greatest software is always the achievement that we're always trying to strive for. Um, I will say being a manager, you get put more on the aspect of managing what you're doing than trying to learn the latest and greatest. So the last three months of being unemployed has been great because I've been able to hone in on some of my older new skills. Um, but outside of that, I would say that any one of these certificates is a huge benefit and bonus to having at least a starting point. And from there, you can take it and do whatever you want. Awesome. Well, thanks for that, Kyle. Uh, and thanks for coming and sharing your experience and perspective. It's uh, really interesting what you do with uh, custom speakers. It really shows just how, how unique uh, of a career you know, set is out there around manufacturing and 3D printing. It's really cool. Yeah, and actually for 3D printing purposes, we would use that for prototyping our actual product rather than spending money to buy a tool. Any one of our drivers was a ten to $15,000 tool set that we would able to be able to run 50,000 units off of. Well, you don't want to spend $10,000 on a part that doesn't work. So by 3D printing it and making sure it works or finding an issue with it and fixing it before you spend the money, uh, it, it was it's unprecedented. You can't, you can't value how much money that saves unless you're actually looking at the dollar value and, and for yourself. It was millions of dollars over the course of seven years that we saved just because we were able to prototype our parts. Awesome. Well, thanks for presenting. I'm going to, I'm going to open it up to Q and a uh, regarding the program. I'm going to also uh, share the link here to apply for one of our uh, six courses that we're offering. Um, you just saw a highlight of the um, graphic design and 3D design uh, sessions. I want to thank our guest speakers again, uh, Kyle and Juliana, who just, that, that was an awesome perspective. It was really awesome to have you guys and uh, to see what it's actually like to um, work your way up into these uh, careers. It's very exciting. Thank you for having me, yeah. So I'm going to also share, uh, in addition to the link to uh, the uh, application there. I'm going to also share a link to uh, sign up for our upcoming seminars. As I mentioned, um, there uh, were a few, or there's three more left. Uh, this is just the first in our series. Um, so if you're interested in other courses, uh, you can go ahead and uh, fill out the, the seminar sheet. And uh, from there, we can uh, get you connected into more learning opportunities like this, where we'll dive into um, our programming course, IT support course, and our marketing course. The next one next week is uh, with Claudette Chateau, who is an educator at Napa Valley College, who teaches in their business and marketing department. And she's going to be teaching uh, or leading a course on uh, digital marketing, which is a course that is uh, provided by Google. So anyone who's interested in uh, potentially taking that course, uh, I encourage you to sign up for next week's session with her. And uh, if you feel that uh, you really enjoyed the presentations by Lisa and Gary and you're ready to apply, uh, go ahead and uh, submit an application. You can uh, learn more about the program and submit your application at napalearns.org slash VCA, which stands for Virtual Career Academy. Uh, and I just put that link in the chat. And if anyone has a question and they wanna come on video and unmute themselves to ask it to either our guest speakers or our presenters, uh, feel free to uh, unmute yourself. And I realize that we're going over time. So if you need to jump off, you can do that and we'll make sure we send a recording to everyone. Um, so uh, if anyone would like to unmute and ask your question or ask it in the chat, uh, feel free to do that now. I just wanted to thank you all for your time and appreciate you coming for the classes. Have a wonderful afternoon or evening. Thanks, Alicia. Anyone else out there? 
I have not a question, but I just wanted, because I've heard of rhino and rhinoceros. Rhino, we call them rhino in Brazil. But rhinoceros, when I was learning um, 3D modeling back in, in 2010, I think. So it's, it's interesting to see that it's still around. Um, it's still used for, for just, for, for, it's not a specific um, software, right? Or is it for everything? Because you said there are specific softwares for um, architecture, for seeing something like, um, like you said, the wind or the water. Is rhinoceros still a thing for that? It's not, that's a great question. It's not specific for uh, like a, any form of tensile strength or architecture specific. I would say it's kind of like a mix between fusion and inventor with 3ds max mixed into it because it does give you perspective windows uh that you can change and actually take into a render that's a lot better and more compiled and higher resolution than directly out of inventor i haven't done it out of fusion recently so i can't advocate for that but uh it's especially my experience overseas with the the naval companies with fedship and amsterdam they're using SolidWorks and then they're using Rhinoceros when they're not in the building because SolidWorks requires heavy licensing and they can't use their, they can't remote into it when they're because of company policy. So they're pulling individual files to run it on Rhinoceros and then implementing it back into SolidWorks. Not, not something that I was really familiar with uh, until I started working with them and they were sending me models from it. So I just was downloading it to work with it. Awesome. Any yeah, we, other questions? We used to teach Rhino at the college too, but we switched it out when Inventor came out. Great. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions from the chat. Uh, uh, I have a quick question. Oh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Um, so I believe it was for the Adobe course preview. Was it mentioned what days? Uh, that the classes would be held? I might have missed it. So we're thinking that we'll do it every Thursday. And right now I have the time set to 6.30 to 7.30, but that is not set in stone. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Great, and there have been some comments or questions about the application. So we have our initial application, which is a Google Form. And then we're asking all of our applicants uh, after we review the form and make sure that you're eligible, we're going to go through and we're going to email you and ask you to send us a personal statement about um, yourself and why you're interested in the opportunity. And so that will be a second part of the application. And so if you have already applied, uh, expect to be seeing an email from us, uh, you know, asking you to complete that second part of the application. So, um, but the first step is to complete that form that is on our website and that's in the chat. So, um, and we recommend that you guys uh, get them in quickly because we're um, still figuring out how many students we can support. And if we do fill up too quickly, we might just make the decision to move forward with anyone who's already applied. So just definitely be trying to get in your application as soon as you uh, think you're ready to make uh, the leap, take the leap and, and get yourself signed up. So it has to be um, students that are in Napa, right? It can't be. Um, it, we're, we're accepting applications from anywhere, but the program is targeted at people who either work or live in the county. So um, okay. that, be, that being said, we are uh, allowing anyone to apply and looking at all of our applications and, um, and we're going to see what we can do to accommodate all the requests that come in. So. Okay. It's a good title, Adobe Certified Designer. Yeah, it's a great, it would look great on a resume. Yeah. <laughs> Opened a lot of doors. Absolutely. I want to be a graphic design specialist. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so I think that'll conclude tonight's session. Uh, we're really excited to uh, stay connected with you guys and hopefully see you at upcoming seminars uh, that we're uh, hosting in the next few weeks here. Um, I will make sure that uh, we send a follow up email sometime tomorrow with a recording of today's session. Um, as well as uh, links to our website and our application. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can reach out to me at mario at uh, or info at napalearns.org or go through our website and uh, contact us using our form. So uh, with that, I think uh, 
we will uh, say goodbye. And I just want to thank uh, our fabulous instructors, Lisa and Gary, as well as uh, Kyle and Juliana, our guest speakers again, uh, for presenting tonight and providing a really engaging session for everyone who's interested in the courses. Awesome. All right, we'll see you guys later. Bye, everyone.